part of our speaker series. Tim Berners Lee is our speaker. To introduce him, the congressman needs no uh, uh, introduction, who is a leader on all technology issues, a pioneer in helping to develop policy on the internet, a key part of uh, the Internet Caucus leadership and the congressional leadership on privacy, internet uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, Congressman Edward Markey from Massachusetts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming out um, here at lunch today. Uh, we will very rarely have this many people packed into this room to hear anyone speak, and you all know why that is the case, because we are going to hear from one of the major deities of the digital domain, and all of you know uh, his role. I have been on the telecommunications committee for 25 years and obviously I have heard uh, everyone uh, speak visions from uh, so many different companies and uh, and from perspectives that uh, uh, that uh, uh, I can I'm in a position to compare it and all I can tell you is that what George W. Bush did for a single W, Tim Berners-Lee did for WWW. And I think that for the rest of eternity, long after historians debate where this president should be ranked, Tim Berners-Lee, Tim Berners-Lee's name will continue to rise uh, in the estimation of all citizens of the planet. Time Magazine, listed Tim as one of the 20 greatest scientific minds of the 20th century. 20 of the 20th century. Other names, Einstein, Freud, Jonas Salk, Watson and Crick, and a few other names you might have heard. He is the youngest. He is alive. <laughs> Very importantly. He resides in Massachusetts, uh, where he has done much of his work uh, for the web. Uh, we're proud to have him as a citizen of our state. He is director of the World Wide Web Consortium at MIT. He plays an enormously influential role in the continuing development of the web, getting major players to agree on common protocols is absolutely vital for interoperability and the maintenance of an open architecture for further innovation. Moreover, Tim's work in developing protocols such as P3P can help policymakers solve thorny privacy debates. Uh, as many of you know, I have long advocated the use of P3P as a way to allow computers to do the talking and thus empower both businesses and consumers uh, uh, in, in how to treat their personal data. Uh, for many uh, past and present contributions to technology, we applaud him with gratitude. Please give the warmest possible welcome to this historic figure. Tim Berners Lee. Well, it's a great honor to be introduced by Congressman Markey. It's, uh, now it's a bit of an introduction. I have to try to live down or live up to or something. But, uh, I could. I got about half an hour because I'm more interested in the questions and concerns that you have than I have that I'm in my own, so I'm going to try to fit into that, but I could talk for two or three days quite easily. I will skimp over some things, therefore, and feel happy to, to just bring them up later on in the second half of this. I'm going to talk a little bit about the semantic web, which is what I see as one of the most interesting things coming down the pike for in web technology. And I'm going to talk also, from my personal point of view, not uh, taking off my hat as director of the World Wide Web Consortium, as the things from the from the social point of view of what what the 
could happen to society uh, if we don't use the internet and the web in the right way. So for, uh, first of all, I'm going to take you back because when I try to explain about the semantic web, I have the same problem as I had in 1989 explaining about the web. Now in 1989, when you try to get information out of a computer system, you could use many different computers, but they all had access to completely different sources of information. And, each, and typically, depending on the manufacturer you bought the computer from, you would use a different network. So uh, all of this sort of computer will be tied to this sort of network and, and talk to each other. And then when you'd use the perhaps you'd, you'd run over a telephone line, you'd dial up, you'd talk to a, uh, maybe a library system and you'd find some information about a book, and there it would be on the screen. And there you would have the privilege of writing it down and typing it into another computer if you wanted to get it there. So this, and this was a tolerable system. I arrived in a large physics lab, I was working in a, uh, at CERN in Geneva, where there are a huge number of different systems, and just getting information from one and putting it into another was, was a great problem. You could buy third-party software, which would suck data out of a documentation control system A and put it into help system B. And I tried to write some of those. So that was the problem that we had. And it was that sort of problem that led me to realize, well, we can abstract this. We can think about this information not as a file on a disk, but let's just think about it as being in an abstract space and then, whoa, everything, all this information can be part of the same abstract space. Hence the invention of the URL, which identifies a document. And that really is the basis of the web. That's the why and the wherefore of the World Wide Web. And in 1991, everything was very much easier because once you had a URL, you could just get hold of a document. And in fact, there was still that great diversity of machines out there. There's still a great diversity of languages, uh, different technologies underneath. The internet connected all these things, but still using all sorts of different sorts of uh, networking technology. What was nice was you had this abstraction, the abstract layer above it, which made it all work together. So that was the step. And in 1989, when I tried to show somebody, look, here's a document, click, here's another one, uh, there was no great wow, because there was the difficulty of making that jump to realize that. Actually, what's really exciting is that hypertext link could go anywhere. So the really important thing about the, the web is this universality, that no matter where it does go, in principle, any hypertext link can go anywhere to information in any culture, any language, in any medium. Information which is, uh, has been jotted down as a, as a crazy idea or information which has been very carefully polished by thousands of designers to meet your every entertainment need. So. Keeping that universality is something which is really important about the web and will be in the future. And every dimension that I've mentioned there needs, needs to be looked at every now and again just to make sure that we're not <coughs> so, somehow hemming the web in as a medium. Now, so, so jump to today, and the web is here, and everything is wonderful, and as a human being you have access to all that information. But now think about the reality when it comes to data. Because what the web does, it does with documents. But now think about actual data that things can process. So for example, just think about time and place information. You have maybe, uh, may maybe in your car you have a navigation system which with global positioning can take you somewhere given that, uh, just a latitude and longitude. And you have a, a little handheld device in your pocket which tells you, where to, to, tells you when things are happening. It's got the concept of time. And so you browse to a website about a conference and you want to go to this event. And here you are browsing the event and you want to beam it into your handheld. You want to say, I, yes, I want to say yes to this, I want to absorb this event. But can you save that web page in a way that you can beam it across to your handheld and the handheld will be able to pick up when it is? No, you now have the privilege, just like before the web, of looking it up from the web page and typing it back into your handheld. Or you can cut it and paste it now. Because it's, uh, and you, um, you can cut and paste it and you can type all the, the coordinates into your GPS system. What's missing is that the fact that the web page is about an event, which has a place and a time, is lost. The meaning of all those fields is lost. There's a huge amount of data on the web, which about the weather, for example, about stock prices, about things you might want to write a program to analyze. That it, it just has a picture of the sun and it has some numbers. 19, sunny. Well, actually, the 19 is the temperature in degrees centigrade. But that information is lost. So you can't write programs to reliably pick up that information. Semantic Web says, let's actually preserve, get that data out there as data. 
so that if an airplane part is compatible with an airplane part, let that be said in a way that a computer can follow that link. And when you ask, when you say you need this part, it can find actually that you've got available in the area this part and, and prove that it's compatible. So the Snap Web is not a Web 2.0 in the, in, the, in the sense that of replacing the web. It's just using the same web, but using it for information which can be repurposed, reused. Reused with meaning, reused by applications, so that if you like it's a problem to what's called in the, uh, in the trade the enterprise application integration problem. Thousands and thousands of dollars are being spent, millions are being spent on the problem of getting the data out of one piece of, uh, of, of corporate software and putting it into, getting it into another, or mixing it with data coming from another piece of corporate software. So the idea of systematic web will fix that. And it's as difficult to understand how dramatic the effect of that will be as it was originally with that problem of first link. You just have to imagine that when you start a new table using your favorite piece of software and you put zip code at the top, that the concept of zip code if you pick it from a menu, but actually, you can, you'll be, you can link that to the concept of zip code on a website somewhere or in another table. And once you've linked it, it's not just, you don't have just two tables where you've noted that zip code means the same thing in two places, but indirectly, the concept of zip code is linked together in all these tables so that you have a sort of a morass. Back in the web today, everything's effectively linked indirectly to everything else. The concept of zip code will be indirectly linked to everybody else who's using the idea of zip code. So suddenly, when you ask questions of this little database you created, suddenly the computer can go and translate those into questions of the whole web of any other databases it can find to answer the question. So it's very powerful. The people who are currently uh, doing this uh, get that twinkle in their eye, the same twinkle as in 1989, but still it's difficult to explain. So, uh, of course, in a lot of ways, the effect of the new uh, of the, the semantic web, web which is processed by my machine, uh, when it comes to looking at the impact on society, it's very similar to the web at the moment in that it's an information tool. Any information tool can be uh, used to great effect by people for good or ill purposes. It can be abused. So we have to watch the effect it's going to have on society. If you're interested in uh, if, on the technical side, there's the sorts of things you'll find there at the, uh, on the semantic web. A large amount of it's just going to be data, things like the, uh, the, the color of the tablecloth is magenta. You know, uh, just, just data about things. Then at the next level of power, there'll be languages which allow you to say things like uh, that if, if somebody has a parent and that parent has a brother, then that original person has a, that last person from an uncle. So define the term uncle in terms of the uh, parent. These sorts, of, these sorts of things are very important because they lay out, allow you to connect data which is expressed in one way to data which is expressed in another way. And that is a huge amount of problem at the moment. Going on, the sorts of technologies which we'll introduce after we've got those rules in place, you can imagine that we might have a rule about who we deal with, who gets into our website, who we're prepared to trade with. We have, and that may be based on a few rules we make, few rules other people make, Look for, there may be rules for who's a member of organization of the World Wide Web Consortium. If anybody's the employee of a member organization, then they can access this set of documents. And there's different sets of rules determining different things. Nice thing about everything being very hard mathematical system. We're not talking about English here, we're talking about very logical things going on. So that uh, when you, if you found that actually you should have access to that web page, your computer can actually produce a proof. It can say, look, using this rule, and this rule, and this rule, and this rule, in my case, ta-da, I have access to that website. And the concept of proof is really nice behind e-commerce. That when somebody says, like, you know, well, you should accept this card, or I get that discount, uh, then the other, the other party can come back and say, the other two computer can come back and say, oh yeah, what? Just, you know, justify that. Get the justification and check it through. When you combine that very solid ability for two computers to justify to each other why, or based on commonly shared understandings, why one should believe, should understand something, if you combine that power with digital signature, which actually you can actually check that the right person said something, then you have a very, very flexible basis for a huge amount of stuff, and certainly all of electronic commerce. So there are some of the reasons why I'm excited about it. I'm excited about this also from the point of view of the director of the World Wide Web Consortium.
Because at the World Wide Web Consortium, we're one of the many places where we're trying to, where we're, a place, we're a meeting place for people to come together and agree about common concepts. Now, there are other, we agree on, we, in the World Wide Web Consortium, people agree on technical protocols, the concepts used by computers when they communicate. So, for example, privacy. Let's define a vocabulary for talking about privacy. We're not going to define the, the a particular standard for privacy for every website in the United States of America, but we are going to define language. So just some basic concepts to be used in the language for talking about privacy. So that I don't have to read through that privacy, that huge, long, involved, small print privacy page out there on the website. Have you ever tried to do that? Nowadays, they're ridiculous. And then when you get to the bottom, they say you should also read links to these other privacy pages of our ad advertisers, which are uh, explicitly included in our privacy policy. This is impossible. So we, so we, make, so we want to make a language so that one computer can talk to the other computer. My browser can talk to the website on behalf of me and check the privacy policy. When we do that, we end up with a vocabulary of terms. This is a piece of personal information. This is a name. This is the sort of thing I... This is uh, what, what I mean by keeping it within the company. So we end up with all these terms, and that's difficult, it's hard work. The life is full of the hard work of taking groups who've got one set of terms and, and, and introducing them to groups who use another set of terms, and then trying to find enough common ground for those two groups to work together. So that evolution of vocabulary, the evolution of concepts, is something which is the business of doing technical standardization. To a large extent, it's the business of being a human being on the planet, being involved in any group. You always it's the business of whether you define a very tight culture or whether you uh, open yourself up to other groups. And the semantic web languages are designed to help manage that. To me, that's, uh, that's very important. In a way, that's one way in which this is a much more exciting technology than the ones uh, uh, we've had before. A lot of the information out there, a very key part of the information out there, the data on the semantic web, is going to be data about information, data about documents. So I talked about privacy. Uh, that's, that's, that's information about information. It says this social entity promises to do only the following things with the following data. There is a huge call for information about information. Uh, just a statement, I trust this. The statement that that particular church feels that it's inappropriate to give that particular web page to anybody under 12. These, these sorts of statements about inf information about information are really the way we run society. Those are the things that we, that's the way we actually decide what to read and what to trust. So it's very important that the web should allow us to, to express those. And we've in fact had metadata languages in the World Wide Web Consortium for things like privacy and cataloging things. And just in order to run the underlying infrastructure of HTTP, which is full of metadata about the thing I'm just about to send you. An email has little metadata headers. So there's a lot of metadata around. About, but we haven't had this very powerful system with rules, uh, with the ability to merge different vocabularies. So we'll have very much more powerful metadata systems coming out of the semantic web. So hopefully that will give us many more powerful tools for solving the social problems, for expressing things about policy. So it'll allow, we'll, we'll be able to really build a web which is an infrastructure for the sort of society we want to create. Remember that the World Wide Web Consortium doesn't dictate what the sort of society we're going to build. What we do is we provide these technical languages which allow you to express what you want to express. And if you want to express laws, then you guys go and make laws. Okay? And I, I'll never decide who I vote for personally, but, uh, but hopefully the, the idea of the semantic web, like the original web, is its universality. It's not defining what's said, uh, what particular things you choose to say. So, the good side for the users is that if there's a lot of metadata out there, it can give the users more control. If the user can find out what the pri privacy policy is, maybe go to the website, find out who runs it, find out what the properties of that organization are, what sorts of social uh, policies are they committed to, what, and, uh, do they have any ecological pol policies. So in principle, you should be able to go through and you should be able to put links in your catalog to the fact that it's really organic, using a term organic as defined by a particular group that, you're, that the consumers are likely to trust. So there's a potential, if it's done right, for users to, for this to be a very empowering thing for users, for them to really be aware of what it is they're reading. You know, who, who wrote it? 
And uh, were they really were they a commercial organisation? Why did they write it? Uh, that sort of thing. When I take this picture, and uh, it's out there on the web. Everybody's copying this picture. Uh, has it, actually, does it have a copyright on it? Things like that. At the moment, a user finds it difficult to know whether they're breaking the law or really upsetting somebody by copying a picture of a tree and putting it in a, in a birthday card to their mother. So, but the metadata hopefully will fix that. We need in this current world and in the new world, we need tools which will help users do that. We need tools which will help. We need software out there which will help publishers put out the status, manage that metadata, derive it, control who has access to things, control, uh, note down who owns them, and so on. But these tools don't do everything. Because the cool tools can talk about copyright, they can talk about ownership, but they can't enforce things. So behind that, if somebody makes a promise using the semantic web, they'll be able to make a very well-defined promise by sending bits, digitally signed bits across the wire, but the technical protocols will never enforce what happens if they break that promise. So we need laws as well. And the people making the laws and the people making the tools need to talk. That's why I'm here, and I'm not doing it all of it, I'm only here for a few minutes. So uh, that's why the World of Ever Consortium works very, tries to work very carefully and relies on to, to, to be a sane place, user groups, advocacy groups, those groups who realize who, who, that there is a particular aspect of the web which needs to be uh, protected. Uh, disability groups, uh, or groups of authors who really want HTML to be something which uh, allows them to do what they want to do. So we have the HTML Writers Guild there in the HTML Working Group defining what sorts of things you can do with web pages from the point of view of people who know, because they're the people who actually earn their living doing day to day. So, uh, what I should say about laws, of course, is that I wouldn't take that too far. In that the day, uh, I personally always hope that the laws will leave, will like the worldwide web technology, be, be minimalist. Uh, allow users choice where they can allow users to have choice when they when it's uh, appropriate, and uh, the laws shouldn't be used to enforce a particular culture. So the web is a very universal space. Let's remember that's very important to it. And uh, neither the technology nor the laws which are it should cramp it in, a, in, a, in uh, any more than is necessary to preserve the same society. Actually, the semantic web I mentioned. Uh, people with disabilities, and in fact we have a whole, one of the four domains in the World Wide Web Consortium is the, Access the Web Accessibility Initiative, WAI. And that, that's uh, been longer a success, and it's a place where the dis uh, disability communities can come in and connect to the technology very early on, and actually make sure it comes out, uh, so, so that web pages, for example, can be read as easily as possible by people who are visually impaired. Uh, the all, all the things which is easy to put in earlier on and are being put in earlier on rather than being reacted against when they've come out wrong at the far end of the industrial pipeline. Um, the, one of the things which was key very early on, before HTML, HTML was based on HTML, and the idea about, HTML, about markup languages in general is that you separate the content, the real meaning, what, what, what the intent of this page is from the actual style, the form in which it's presented. So, for example, now you'd have a, you might have a style sheet which explains that it should have a blue background, that it should be tannic, and use this font. Uh, whereas the markup spe separately specifies that logically this is a heading, this is a, and these are uh, bulleted, this is a list. And that information makes it much easier for somebody on the, who, who's using a screen reader, for example, or, or using a more sophisticated piece of software which would go to go into the page and actually take them through it and ask whether you want to have the, this long list of hundred items read out or, or summarized, for example. So, uh, and so this separation of form and content has been a really important thing which we've tried to push uh, also because when you try to, when you specify the form too closely, so you make a web page that only works on a 800 by 600 pixel laptop, uh, this is very short-sighted, particularly when you think of all the people who are going to be looking at it, looking at it on their mobile phones. Um, and that separation becomes, it really becomes a sort of maximum with the semantic web, where the data is there as data, and there are a huge number of ways in which you can present it. So from the point of view of both uh, accessibility and internationalization, you can, uh, 
You could take that same data and put it in another language. Uh, you can put it across the stream, right to that. You can read it out. You can have a conversation about it. The semantic web, in a way, is not only be better for computers to process, it's also much more flexible when it comes to being presented to people. Now, as I said, this is a, this is a place where I take off my W3C hat, and that when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to policy issues, the consortium is not really the place where policy issues are defined, and I don't speak for the members of the consortium. But I just as, uh, as the inventor of the web, I, I say one thing to you, that it is really important, it always has been important, to keep the web universal. And for me, the independence of the media is something which is really, really important. Now, I guess I was, I was brought up in Britain listen, looking, watching BBC television, but when on a children's show they showed you how to make a vase for your mother by chopping the top off a dishwashing liquid bottle. They never mentioned the name of a, of a detergent, and they actually carefully painted out the name on, the, on everything they used, including the glue. You knew they were using copy decks because you could tell from the shape of the tube, but it was all carefully painted out. There was this very strong feeling that if you're going to, that neutrality is important. And that, and this very strong feeling that there has been in the past if, uh, for telecommunications, a feeling that if, look, if you're going to sell one person a phone, you should sell, it, sell anybody a phone because that's just uh, very important. When you look at the web, there are a lot of different markets are different, lots of different pieces of technology. My feeling is it's really important for the sanity of this planet that they remain the same. The, the internet itself, when you buy internet connectivity, you should buy internet connectivity. And internet connectivity means that there's a thing called internet packet. It has on the front an address. It's one of those things that number dot number dot number dot number. That's what goes on the front of an internet packet. You poke it into the internet to an internet connection and that means an internet, if you've been sold internet service, that means that packet should go to the other end and pop out. It's very simple. There's lots of wizards in the way, in, in the middle, but you don't, don't have to worry about that. You don't pay for somebody looking at that and wondering whether it's going to uh, one of their sites or one of their competitor sites, and taking a little time with it if it goes to one of the competitor sites, or maybe throwing everyone in ten away. You don't pay for somebody realizing, oh, that person's asking for a website. It's not one of ours, but we can pretend to be that site, give them the content, Ask for it, give them the content, and put a few ads around the site. Or, we are, well, as it's the first time in this hotel, we'd like to tell them about the spa facilities before they do any, any of this other surfing. There are all kinds of sneaky ways in which you find this pure internet service being, uh, is being polluted. It's, it's, if you like, it's a, it's, a, it's a microscopic kind of internet fraud that is that's very tempting to, for companies to get into. So I feel it's really important to keep internet provision pure, like you get water pure. When you, just can, when you distribute electricity to somebody, it's very difficult to distribute the sort of electricity they can only use for, for a television and not use for a rich refrigerator. But with the internet, it's kind of unfortunately easy if you go, if you want to do it, if the, and there's a huge financial incentive often to do it, to start looking at what they're doing and start affecting what they're doing. And, uh, and this is in fact very tricky, because conversely you might realize that there's a there should be a right that a large site might have to pay more money in order to get better access to, to their customers. So, the, 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 it, so it's not, it, it's not to, totally simple, but fair access to the internet is really important. There's also the question of the, there's the internet and there's the software. There's, you, get a, you buy a network connection, you buy software, you buy some hardware. Well, in fact, quite often you get them for free. So you might get your hardware, you might pay for the hardware, and it comes with some software on it. You can sometimes change that if it's a PC. If you, it's a phone, you can't. It just comes with the software. And when you get some software which allows you to get access to the internet, it's very tempting to put a few nice buttons on there, like search the web. And if, you, if you're writing software and you happen to own a shoe store and somebody types search the web for shoes, it's very tempting to, pri to, to first suggest that, that that search could go to a particular search engine which will happen to take somebody to your shoe store. So there's a connection, there's a, there's a horrible failure mode here where you buy a piece of hardware and you thought you were getting access to the internet, the great internet. Now you have access to all the knowledge that humankind has managed to put into this. And in fact what you're getting is you're getting a button on the, on the piece of hardware which says search the internet, takes you a particular search site which has been paid to primarily give you uh, access to pointers to particular information. And to me, that's horrible. 
To me, I don't, when I look at internet access, I think it's really important to get fair access. It's important for commerce. It's important to the free market. You must have a fair market out there. It's very important that if I start a company, I can advertise my goods and that they will be seen just as the same as, as, a, as, a, as another. People may choose not to make links to my goods because they don't like them, but that's their problem. But if somebody wants to browse my site, then I should be, uh, uh, that fair access to information is important to the market economy. It's very important for education and research. It's very important. It's, if when you connect to the internet, some large company that you paid some money to or didn't even realize that you were indirectly paying money to, the company that generously gave you the free computer for free is controlling what you see. Well, that's not what the sort of place I want to bring my kids up. It's important for the democracy. Of course, can you imagine when you go to the internet, the uh, internet service provider carefully suggesting uh, uh, which political opinions and which newspaper articles will tend to come up further up, just tend to drift up into the first page of the search engine. So, there are, so to me, keeping that, making the provision of internet services really isolated from the provision of content. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, as to say, the provision of a, a conduit as an independent thing, it, I said it from the provision of a content or the provision of other things over the internet, to me is something which we've got to manage one way or another, and I don't know how uh, the best way of doing that. So, society will change with the web. It is changing with the web. We have a new medium. It's, of course, really. It's the same, same old society, and the laws are the same old laws. But as it changes, which things will actually change? Uh, we won't change, I won't change, I won't be able to read more stuff. We have this choice as to whether we globalize or whether we end up with very strong compartmentalization. That I think is simply a choice. And I think, in fact, it's made by people when they browse. And I think, in fact, uh, that we will end up with some very large websites and lots of little ones, and there will be a mixture. But I know, because the questions people ask me, that they're very worried about just ending up with five big websites or one big website, uh, and no little ones. Or else that they're worried about ending up with just a lot of uh, freaky cult sites and no mainstream sites. You know, they're basically equally, equally worried about each extreme. In fact, I think people behave and choose their, their, their reading material so that that won't happen. Uh, we've got questions about who ends up with more of the power, the people, the organizations, the companies, the governments. I think one of the, these, some of these trade-offs have all, always been there, but they're drawn into very sharp focus because they happen much more urgently and fast and have a much more dramatic effect on the internet. One of the things which I think is different is that we have a, a difference in the way we connect ourselves, that traditionally everything has been organized in a very uh, hierarchical and typically geographical way. That you're a member of a group because that group actually is locally. You can just cycle over to their meetings. And that group is part of a larger regional group and so on. And that hierarchical system has worked to a certain extent. But we're always fighting the way of how do we scale up large organizations? How do we manage large companies? How do we, when trying to get world peace, how do you manage to get people that are in one small family over here to realize that in that small family over there, that they're indirectly voting to bomb? that these, actually, these, uh, these kids are children, just, uh, are children just like theirs. When we try to get that sort of connectivity understanding, one of the things the web does, is by breaking through the <coughs> geographical bounds, it means that we have now organizations and groups and different social structures that weave in a web and break through that tree. And a web-like connectivity can be much more gooey, much more uh, with, with a few threads, if you make them between, can make them between random places, I think you can make society very much more wholesome. You can have, you have more understanding for the same amount of time spent by each person talking on the phone and, and writing email. Because that person now has a much greater choice of who they do that with. And as that choice is exercised by people all across America, all across the world, you'll find that you end up with much more interwoven society, move, going from something uh, you know, sort of like a bunch of grapes to more like something which is that uh, you find when you eventually unplug the drain. <laughs> find something that's resisted all attempts to move it, a very, very interwoven lump with almost everything in it. 
So with that wonderful, uh, uh, with that wonderful analogy for society, uh, I'll turn the time over to questions. Thanks for your attention. up to two, so wherever we can push something over the fence, uh, and the, the management of the domain names, we're very pleased to push it over the fence. Now, in fact, I have personally a lot of concerns, and a lot of my colleagues have a lot of concerns in what has been happening recently. I think that uh, my concerns are about uh, the persistence of domain names. I would like, I worry that about those error 404 and final founds and uh, uh, your, you know, your web, the, the site you're trying to get to doesn't exist anymore errors because I don't think companies realize how important it is to keep information persistent uh, and I don't think there's either the technical or social infrastructure to set that up so I feel that we need a, a part of the domain name space or, uh, or maybe just a way of using the domain name space which will allow people to keep domain names and allow, if they, as people go away, the organizations go away, allow the information within those websites to be preserved by a trust for, uh, one or more trusts for posterity or something like that. So I think we need to address uh, persistence. I also am really concerned as an inhabitant of this, um, of this space uh, uh, of the way that the way domain names are being managed among, uh, in the past has been, in some cases, disastrous. That some of the organizations charged with doing it have allowed them to be stolen. Uh, you find a perfectly respectable website has been taken over by a porn site. Uh, I, uh, I don't think that the way uh, that the way these things are being run at the moment is uh, uh, is, is a, uh, has has worked in, in many cases. So the fact that, uh, that there's been some piracy and kidnapping, that people who will manage to get hold of your domain name one way or another, perhaps to a site oversight, uh, to, in fact, you didn't pay your bill for five minutes, uh, will allow during that five minutes will allow will, will to take you back and then, uh, and then hold it as ransom and uh, ask for a million dollars if you'd like it back. This sort of business, I think, is crazy. Uh, it's, uh, we, we're not, we're so, we're, we have a civilized society, we shouldn't run the the, the, the domain name system as though it's uh, pioneer days. Question back there. Uh, the technology is a great semantic web that thrill the users potentially to find information very quickly. Is potentially the same technologies that would be used to gather intelligence and would scare the pants off people of what they're doing. How do you reconcile the acceleration of finding information against the privacy violations I think we have to address privacy. With P3P, we've done the first step on the technology side of addressing privacy. We need to address it on the legislative side as well. When we go into semantic web, we will have that experience. And yes, it's going to be possible with, some power, with powerful tools to amass data, for example, and also to do inference, to pick up data about all the data about persons. All about all the data about an anonymous person, get enough data about them to then pin the name on. Um, it will be possible. Also, it will be more, it will be easier to write rules about what you are and are not allowed to do, about who can and cannot have information access to that information. And it will also be easier to check for global consistency, so that a human being can go out and access as just a regular old person with a dial-up modem might be able to go out and pick up the financial information about you know, savings and loans organizations and be the first to actually prevent a disaster by noticing something which is wrong but somebody else, that somebody else didn't. Uh, maybe it might be easier to find. For, so for example, if you decide you're going to address privacy by, in the same, as in Europe by saying that if 
uh, company keeps information about me, they should allow me to get access to that information and check it, and if, and if necessary, correct things that are wrong or ask them to remove things which are inappropriate. Well, that can all be done using, you know, when this is all semantic web stuff, then I'll be able to write a program to do that. So I will actually be able to go every night to all the people that I have dealings with and see what they're holding and seeing where they can see where they get it from and ask them what they're using it for. So in a way, this can be used very much to my advantage. Sure. Derek Willis from Congressional Quarterly. Um, you spoke about uh, keeping internet services isolated from uh, providing content to people. I was wondering what your thoughts were on um, the smart tags that Microsoft has been sort of testing in the new XP operating system and whether or not the ability to link, to put in links on other people's content links back to Microsoft or to other sites, whether or not that sort of threatens the integrity. I, I, I don't know about the smart tags thing. I have to... Okay. I, I Unless there's something else you can... It's a question about annotation, allowing people to put annotations. Uh, it's, it's about allowing uh, people to essentially edit internet documents, web documents, so that if a user would put their cursor over it, it would link to sort of a suggested site or a suggested resource that that person, that the, the company or person who's doing the editing could, you know, suggest. Okay, this is, right, this is, this is one of many. Uh, attempts to try to produce annotation tools. Annotation tools are very very valuable. When you go over a document, normally you, you do it with a, a, a pen. And uh, very often you share those scribblings with somebody else. So, and so for a long time, the t technical community has been trying to make that really easy to do on a browser. And one of the things that they didn't uh, attack until recently is that when you make an annotation, that annotation is really part of some group of annotations which you have to manage socially. So for example, if I'm, so I may decide I'm gonna annotate this in the context of my team, and I'm gonna browse in the context of this corpus, which has a set of annotations, and also my team, which has a set of annotations. So I will see blue stickies on it if, if somebody in this corpus has, uh, has written something about it, and, so, and yellow stickies will appear on the document if somebody in my team has written things about it. Managing the user interface to that is important, and uh, so that you realize that, that it's very important that the user should have the choice. So if the user has the choice that I would like to see the doc this document with the comments of this group of people on it, then I think that that's totally reasonable because the user sees that. If somebody has stuck in the way and intercepted the packets on their way to the, to the web, on the way back from the, from the server, and inserted their yellow stickies, uh, so that, for example, I'm getting a misrepresentation of what was originally said by the original site, then that, of course, is fraudulent and horrible. But, uh, so, so the, the important thing, as with many of these questions about the, the tools on the web, is that it's clear what's going on. If it's clear who wrote what, and if, it's, and if the user has control of, uh, of the particular sets of annotations that they're using, uh, they, it, but if, in fact, they're forced by their hardware manufacturer or their software manufacturer to actually always take comments from that manufacturer's home annotation server, then, uh, then obviously, no, I wouldn't go along with that. I would, uh, I, I would hate it if I was forced into using that. Can I ask a question? Um, can the semantic web help solve the problem for systems so that you would know that you are on the web and that you aren't, you haven't been diverted to? Well, you know, for better or worse, some uh, commercial application, is there a way that there's that primary level that you know that, that you are on the web, that you haven't been diverted, that uh, that something is missing? Um, is there, can uh, that be technically? Can you, this is the things which technically you can do, uh, uh, we have a, the, the consortium, we have a, a standard for external digital signature, so for example, uh, if people uh, deploy that and, and get around to digitally signing their the documents, and also we have a very flexible structure, a web of trust out there, which will allow you to actually say that you give, a, give the rules you use for trusting people, then your computer will be able to check that. So using those rules, yes, it can verify that this signature, this was signed by somebody who's by a key, which is in fact one of the ones which you indirectly trust, because you trust all those which are recommended by such and such a magazine or whatever. So, 
uh, digital signature can really help that, but you need those semantic web languages for managing, for making the web of, uh, the web of trust. When it comes to uh, the, the people, uh, this sort of fraudulent interception of uh, of data, I think it just has to be established that there's a standard that, that is not what that, that that's unacceptable. I think the technical community forever has always imagined that. Uh, that it was unacceptable, and I think it, so. I think probably we need a few test cases in which somehow both uh, we need either some legislation underneath it, or we need to be pulled back to some existing legislation which points out that in fact it's fraudulent or it's a misrepresentation of the service or something. I don't know where, how that will be done, but we need the community as a whole to just agree that that, in, that, that, that isn't wrong. You can't go around doing that. Yeah, um, AOL seems to be like the ultimate of where the provision of internet services and content. Are not isolated; they're inextricably linked. Do you have concerns that they have too much power, or potentially have too much power, and should the government do anything? I can take my hat off as much as I like, but I can't get away from the fact that I direct a consortium of, two, of uh, over 500 organizations, of which AOL is one. And if I were to get to, to, to uh, discuss in great detail about one particular member's uh, uh, appropriate behavior or not, I, 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 it would make my life more difficult. <laughs> so I, <laughs> you are have not in this situation. <laughs> My name is Alan Densmark with the American Foundation for the Blind. I don't know if anybody in the room appreciates how much the Web Access Initiative has done, not only for disability access, but for things that are very simple and central to what a lot of us are talking about as well, and that is identifying your web page faster, making it run faster. The reason I bring this up is I wonder how transferable this model is to what you're talking about in the semantic way. Uh, thank you. And, uh, I will pass up the, uh, the compliments on the Judy Brewer and the, and the initiative because uh, 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 I, yeah, I think they have, they have a, a great effect. One of the nice things about most of the work which is done in making the web uh, more accessible is that it has a spin-off. The companies which have done this, who have thought about blind users, suddenly realize that they can access people who are using cell phones, be accessed by people who are using cell phones, and so on. So yes, it means that it tends to mean that the pages, web pages improve in lots of different ways. And in a way, the same sort of thing happens with the semantic web. What happens? What happens is that you are being cleaner and more precise about the information out there. Uh, you are, uh, and by doing that, by actually putting down what you really mean, you know, it, 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 getting towards mathematical precision as opposed to uh, the, uh, graph, uh, the artist's impression, that it has been us awesome in so many ways, and accessibility is one. And, and internationalization is another one. Because suddenly, you find that the data can be read by somebody in another language. And so, yes, the same sort of uh, with the semantic web, the same sort of uh, synergy happens across all these various areas where we're trying to improve the, the web. Question back there. What kind of things do you think should be done to make the web Although there are, of course, lots of ways, lots of, there's lots of technology available for uh, for putting filter in, a filter in so that you or, or the children in your care are not uh, they're not subjected to it. And, and in fact, one of the, that was one of the that was perhaps the first major metadata project <coughs> where our consortium was picked. And so we said then the metadata was the, an important part of the solution. And uh, I say that, that again. Now, in fact, a lot of these technologies, some of them are, some of them use PIX, some of them, they, they fit in in different ways, and they, and they don't, uh, there isn't a lot of exchange of lists of book and bag sites that are uh, using standards. And we hope that there would be, that user choice would be increased because you would be able to go and get one piece of software, but then go and select the, the particular source you're using as for judgment about sites. Because we really 
wouldn't want to end up with a situation where there's one uh, where there's one central body deciding what's appropriate and what's not in Washington D.C. or anywhere else. Uh, and so I think, to a large extent, some of what we'd hoped has happened is that you do have a choice of different pieces of software, but if you don't have this second-level choice where you can so much where you can choose the software and then choose your uh, choose the pick server. So I, I still like to see that happen. Uh, I think one of the things that's obvious is that it's very difficult. It takes a lot of time. That information is uh, there's a relatively small market for it. Uh, it's it's uh, it takes a long time to go through go looking at sites and checking them out. So. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of, uh, of excess. You don't find that every church has, to, has to got its own list because it just hasn't got the time to put it together. I have a question about the digital divide. What do you see as a way to alleviate the digital divide? Whether it be through access to computers or even technology Well, what do I see as the way to uh, alleviate the uh, digital divide? If I had the answer to that, it would take three hours. I, but. Some things I think, I, first of all, I distinguish between the digital divide in the USA and the digital divide internationally. And I think where it's reasonable to be worried about the digital divide within the USA, but it's very, very much more reasonable to be worried about it internationally. Uh, and one of the things, one of the things that does it takes money, uh, you have to actually, if you're going to put internet connectivity into a developing country, you have to actually spend some money on international aid in order to make that happen. That's one of the ways. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward is to, is to just turn up a week on that. And uh, I think, in fact, within the USA, I see the internet it, going the way of the telephone largely, and that it does achieve a very strong penetration for, uh, of its own accord. Whereas in the, uh, when you look at developing countries, then there's this awkward, you always have this awkward question is, is it reasonable to give it to me putting in optic fiber before you put in PVC tubing for, plain, for clean water? And uh, that is difficult, and I've heard people uh, in all different areas come out of both sides of that. One of the questions we have to ask ourselves is whether the technology of the internet has been designed for the West, by the West. So have we, in fact, written in an assumption that we will all be connecting into a backplane, backbone, and using telecom and, and assuming that there is a ministry to the structure, for example, so I think one of the interesting things about wireless is not to just make wireless links which emulate the way the internet works right now, but to make completely autonomous devices which have chips in them which can autonomously organize themselves. So that if you buy two, if you buy one, uh, it, does, it, it tells you the time. If you buy two, you have walkie-talkies. If you buy three, you have a little telephone system in the family, and then suddenly as other people in the village buy them, you find that you, uh, these things are talking, they're arranging themselves into a network and giving, yourself, giving themselves numbers, and then one, after a while, they enact one of them to become a, a, an exchange because suddenly the next village has, has come within right, range. So the idea of a completely autonomous, self-organizing network, uh, uh, wireless things, I think it's uh, an interesting way to go for research uh, because not only does it get over the technological, uh, it, it doesn't get over the economic, the economic problems of having money to buy them, but it also gets over the problems of uh, the bureaucracy in developing countries sometimes just uh, being uh, controlled by monopoly tele uh, telecom suppliers or just too slow to put the, the, the vision into getting it out there. It means that it could really start from the grassroots by, uh, by people in villages buying things that look like walkie talkies. Uh, there was a question over here, then I'll come over here. Do you believe that we're headed towards uh, requiring these commercial websites to uh, use the repeat? Do you think we're in? Uh, there must be, must be lots of people um, in the room, in this room, much better positioned to guess what's going to happen in the Congress than I. I, I, I would have one. <laughs> that, that it would be. I don't think Congress would mandate a particular technology, um, but I think there will be a demand. Um, a lot of sites, I think, will want to be P3P compliant so their customers can read their privacy statements. And that if you want to get to a simple privacy regime where consumers can say, I, I got it, I can find it, P3P is one of the technologies that, that will do that. And so it may be one of the ways that a company can meet its privacy requirement that there was such a notifying the customer. And notice that your website might want to do uh, trade with people in Europe and refers uh, 
and they might, and people in Europe, may assume that they're going to have privacy unless they give their informed consent otherwise. And the idea of informed consent, P3P gives you a much quicker way of doing it on a website. They can say, basically, if anybody has set their P3P profile up in this way, which is quite a reasonable way, they'll just breeze through our site. Anybody else, if they're from Europe, we may be violating a European regulation. So, until we get this jurisdiction thing figured out, uh, maybe we better, well, maybe it'd be better just best to put P3P in, because after all, all our European sites, our websites, are using the same software. So it may be that it spreads, spreads, spreads from other countries. We still have a couple more minutes, a couple more questions. Yes, sir. I was wondering what your thoughts were um, as the uh, internet takes a more prominent role uh, lives around the world uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. How that will change the uh, political landscape, specifically uh, campaigns uh, as full of data and it's terrible to uh, voters? How will the web change political campaigns? I tell you how I'd like it to change political campaigns. I would like. Uh, behind the web, that there to be an ethos that when your candidate makes that soundbite, more Americans today than ever before do X. You know? that behind that, that's linked to a justification which you produce. <laughs> and which is additive. <laughs> okay, that's the, way, that, that's the sort of uh, debate in which the, the, a battle of the links, in which there is a, there is a congressional annotation server. And in which, uh, where, when, so when, when you say, actually, this is justified by these figure, figures from forest research, uh, somebody else can stick a little yellow sticky on top of yours yellow sticky and say, oh, no, it isn't, because now, some of the figures underneath, you might be able to extract, one might be able to extract from the semantic web. But certainly, I, uh, to see some sort of moderated discussion in which one can take those, those some of the, those things, whether they're election promises, or, 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 or statements about how the world, world is uh, and break them down are, uh, I, I think, will be great. Various people have tried, one of them, to make, to, to build systems which use the web as a, as a collaborative place for coming to agreement. And some of these have had great ideals that we'll, well, we will, we will, we will make something which will allow people to basically build the argument, the structure of the argument on the web until all these false leads end up blocked by red lights and just one result will, will have the green light and then the whole thing will turn green and shrink and, and we will move and we will move on to tackle the next great problem. Uh, this is very difficult to do in fact. I still have hopes that somebody will hit on that, that combination of, social, of the social process and the technical tools behind it which actually make it happen. And in fact within the World Wide Consortium we've taken Halfway through our life, we we decided, uh, like today, we decided to uh, uh, eat our own dog food. Uh, we were doing, we've been saying that the web should be used for collaborative work for so long, it hadn't been happening. So we decided, well, we've got to find out what makes it difficult. We're going to do it. So we are going to try to do this sort of thing. We are going to do our reviews on. We hope to do our reviews online. Uh, management of all the, uh, of all the groups, the document, the translations of documents online, the, the question of when somebody stops the document and says, "Wait, well, even though I am only one amongst millions, I find a serious flaw which will overturn the whole spec." So, you know, how do they deal with that? How does that get, get attached to the minority opinion and manage and have that whole thing basically so that the administration, administration of, the, of the process is run by the machines, so we don't have to worry about it, but that process which is the tricky bit, is designed so that we, it's fair and it's fast and all the things one likes to do with, uh, with, with technical and social or government. One question. Um, what is the Internet 2 and how does it relate to the Internet? The Internet 2 that the universities are putting in? I think into, well, Internet 2 came from a realization that the internet, uh, there was a phase, horrible phase when you couldn't get funding for, the, uh, for anything with the word Internet in it because some of the funding of uh, for some of the Funding authorities felt that the internet was done, and the realization that there are lots of uh, that there, are, there was a lot of research needed. So the internet too is um, uh, it's research on new ways to develop internet, and also it's, it's uh, uh, infrastructure of very very high bandwidth lines to do that research over, so that you can experiment with high bandwidth operators. So it's trying to get it's an attempt to get the research and the universities back out of the, out to the front uh, to. Uh, into the research area again, so they are tackling the problems which the rest of us will have when we have 10 gig 
gigabit access tunnel, particularly when it's coming into our front. Last question, then we have to close. Does the semantic web give uh, governments that uh, don't care much about free speech the capability to uh, filter out more information <coughs> by using that metadata to identify things that they believe their citizens shouldn't have access to? And if it does, how do you deal with that? I pointed out that the semantic web is a, it's a very, very generic thing, so, um, and it helps in a way. Whatever you're trying to do, it makes it easier. So in a way, uh, when information is flowing through a pipe, if you happen to have control of the pipe, then it makes it easy to, uh, you can imagine how it would make it easy for, for, for a country to see the data that's flowing through and, to, uh, and suppress data that they don't like to see. However, I think that uh, the semantic web also works on the other side in that it makes manipulation and passage of data very easy and there's so many ways to, uh, at the same time as we get the semantic web technology coming along, we've got encryption and we've got uh, digital signatures so you can check that the, that the information is valid, it really did come from that source, it hasn't been faked, pieces haven't been taken out of it, hasn't been censored, uh, and you can, uh, you can encrypt it so that nobody knows what's really going on. So you're talking about, so, so I don't really think that issue is what will affect that if a country really wants to control what happens, uh, they'll be able, they will do it through fear by doing really horrible things to people, to the few people they catch who do, who do things that they don't want. Uh, it doesn't really come down to the tech. I don't think it comes down to the technology very much. Thank you very much. Jim. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and uh, Tim and Danny Weitzner at the World Wide Web Consortium. I'm sure you can find them on the net um, and they'll answer all your questions. Uh, uh, thank you on behalf of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee and the Caucus uh, for attending today. Thank you.